Hello, and welcome to Young at Heart. Today, we are going to talk about vulnerability and other things like it. I'm Deborah Hansen Conant. I'm a composer, a performer, and a creativity coach and thinker. And I am here with Kathleen Wiley, who is a Jungian analyst. And we both play the harp. And so this is called Young at Heart. So Kathleen, vulnerability. I was thinking this morning as I struggled with some of my tech and as I have lately been working to experience and um, be willing to have more vulnerability, <laughs> vulnerability in my life, that there is a difference between unreliability, um, precariousness, and vulnerability. So as I put my computer up here on this thing, that feels a little precarious. As I get frustrated with my equipment that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work, that feels unreliable. And at the same time, I'm really working to let myself be vulnerable. And they seem similar, but different. Mm -hmm. I'll bet you know something about that. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> you know, um, Vulnerability is just one of those aspects of the human condition. And um, meaning that we are not in control. And so sometimes things hold and sometimes things don't hold. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work. And so vulnerability to me always harkens back to how, you know, we aren't in charge and we can be impacted randomly out of the clear blue, you know, in ways that don't feel good, as well as in ways that do touch us and feel supportive and loving. So the paradox here is that in order to feel loved and supported and like we've something's holding us, we have to be able to feel our vulnerability. But feeling our vulnerability always puts us at risk of feeling dropped or like the bottom falls out, or that something doesn't hold. Clearly, when things aren't reliable, or there is something precarious that we're not so sure we can lean into and trust, our vulnerability gets activated. And so part of what we all have to do as we become adults and we want to live the creative life um, in the world, whether it's just in our kitchen or it's at our instrument or it's in our relationship, or whatever, is we have to begin to be able to distinguish um, distinguish nuances of vulnerability. And the vulnerability, for instance, of a computer not working, um, which is a very different vulnerability in terms of one's true safety of self physically, emotionally, and mentally, versus, say, the vulnerability of being um, attacked. Oh, interesting. You know? Oh, you know? okay. and I was thinking also of vulnerability um, uh, the, uh, that, but I was thinking of vulnerability in terms of actually revealing myself artistically. Mm -hmm. And I, because I've noticed that, um, I've noticed that as I start to explore vulnerability in my own life and what it opens me up to, mm -hmm. that I can identify it by all I describe it is, is an icky feeling. Uh -huh. And so, and so as I experience more and more, more icky feelings during the day, as I be able to identify them, and in the past I would be like, oh, that I got to not do that. I'd be like, mm -hmm. oh, wait, this is an icky feeling. It could be a moment for vulnerability. Can we stop for a second? So I've become aware of that. And as I'm becoming aware of those different, like you said, the nuances are distinguishing between icky feelings, I can start to go back and think, oh, that's an icky feeling like every time ever since i've been a kid um and started writing my own music mm -hmm. when i would sit down at the piano or at the harp and play something that really was from me and especially and, and if and if the audience whether it was one person or three thousand people are really focused i feel like in the middle of that piece we are one we are in a world together and as i come to the end of the piece and i know that world is going to go away i get anxious i don't want it to go away i want us to be in that world mm -hmm. and in the space between the world of music and the world of not music is a place that is both deeply vulnerable and 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 scary so one of the most beautiful things i've ever experienced and i is when i end a piece like the nightingale 
and um, which is a, a, just a vulnerable piece about my mother. And I'm, and I'm there in the silence and the audience doesn't clap. Mm -hmm. And that moment is so powerful and so full of trust on their part and my part to really trust that moment that we're in. Mm -hmm. And I wish it would last forever. You know, I just, I just love that moment. I know that that's a beautiful feeling of vulnerability. And then right afterwards, it's right afterwards that I feel kind of like, oh, like, oh, oh, what did I just do? <laughs> well, yeah, and I think what you're talking about there is the kind of vulnerability where you're not hidden at all but you're very exposed in the rawness of your own experiencing, the rawness of your own emotional state at that moment without anything covering you up or hiding you, without having any pre-planned gestures or responses, but just being purely in the experience of the moment. And I do believe music can invite us the, the musician as well as the listener into that place where i love the term that the boston process change study group a psycho and it was an interdisciplinary group looking at what really makes the difference in the therapeutic relationship and so what they're saying makes the difference are what they're calling moments of meeting what you are describing between you and the audience in that space as the nightingale ends is a moment of meeting where, yeah, where you are open at, I'm going to say at a soul level, the audience is open at a soul level, or if that word gets in the way for people, we could say open on the heart level and there's a meeting and it doesn't require words. It doesn't require applause. And there's a beautiful, meeting that happens right where and it seems like it even requires the suspension of all those conventions of oh, yes like applause yes because the convention is a defense against the vulnerability of the experience or another way of saying it is the convention of the applause takes one out of being with one's experience to doing something for another. You know, it, it takes one away from that purity of the rawness of one's own. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. it's not like I don't like applause. I mean, one of the things I love about applause is that I, I think it is such a beautiful response to you know, someone's up there with all the power and in the spotlight and they have the instrument and they do the thing. And then every person in the audience takes the one instrument they have, you know, which is their two mm -hmm. hands and it's, that they always have. And then they, you know, that they, they, they respond back. And it, it's so, to me, it's just the, the heart of, of the respect of whatever instrument we do have and the beauty of that sound, no matter what it is. So, um, and, and yet, and, and so, so that too is beautiful, but I hear what you're saying that when, when, when we're, when we're doing it by convention, it's different than when we're actually following. And if, if, if it's conventional to clap at a certain point and everyone, 3000 people or five people or whatever, mm -hmm. agree to not for a moment, Mm -hmm. That is so powerful. And I would say that what you said, a moment of meeting is just what a beautiful. Yeah. And it's a moment of meeting that, again, it's, it's what sometimes people try to get at with being the, the being state versus the doing state. And that moment, there is a shared experience of being that the applause or the music you're playing is part of the doing. We need both. One is not, it, it, it's not that um, we don't want both. In fact, as you were talking, I was thinking that when the, uh, the listeners or the audience claps, it's their response, it's their feedback, it's their way of dialoguing. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, and so there's something, there's a different kind of meeting that happens in dialoguing. I see. Oh, I see. Right. 
Yeah, because it feels different to you. There's a different meeting when they're clapping than when all of you are there in that suspended moment of silence where you're just in the, pure, the space of pure being, where the music has taken you. Right. Mm -hmm. In the space of pure being, yeah. where the music has taken you. Yes. And that I'm observing through my students and myself happens has nothing to do with virtuosity has nothing to do with technical ability it has to do with willingness right i did an exercise with my students this year this um this week um, because it's mother's day and i had them take um a, a song a very simple song and create a message with it mm -hmm. and, and 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 they and really the this the thing that was hardest for them was to make the space between the playing and the speaking and they were just doing something simple like and, and really focusing here and then turning and saying mom i want to send you a message on mother's day and i can't be with you and so i'm going to do the best i can to reach you with music you were my first sound or i mean what whatever whatever each person said that it, it and and if they couldn't play all of that they couldn't play that they really could just play two notes connect here connect there and i think what i'm here and i was it was so moving each of them you know shared that on screen and i was just so moved by by people of all different abilities and what i'm hearing you say right now is that i was moved by was it the moment of being the 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 the, the moment the, of meeting the there moment, was a moment meeting. of meeting and then you also said something about being the moment of meeting and the something of being. oh the uh the uh, pure space be the being in the space of pure being uh, okay, be in the space of pure being. Okay, the, the space moment, of pure the being. Moment of meeting in the space of pure being. Yes, and that is, you know, that's what I love to see. Is what, and and okay. So now I'm hearing. Okay, so uh, I started playing the harp because. I felt so, in part, you know, one of the reasons, I felt so vulnerable with my actual art form, which was writing music and playing the piano. And the harp seemed like, oh, it's a classical instrument and I can become a classical harp player and I can invest in that. And, and it was a way of hiding. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really was a way of hiding. And then through a life's journey, it taught me to find it as a way of revealing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is our life's journey that we may, you know, begin by hiding, finding safety in something that then, you know, takes the hiding away, hopefully. Um, why, where am I going with this? Help, help. <laughs> well, I think what you're talking about is you experienced something that at first was a defense for you, going to the heart right. and hiding as actually becoming the thing that has allowed you to know yourself more deeply and to share more deeply. And this is a basic Jungian principle that within quote, the problem or the defense unquote is the, is the cure is what's needed for the cure that well, I, no, I, I would love to hear a lot more about that. I'll talk more. Well, about it, it just means for anything that we are aware that we're doing, where we are hiding, for instance, or what we are aware we're doing something that um, we don't want to be doing, or we're doing something that we want to do, but there's something missing of our own self in it, then in, in the behavior itself, in that situation, is the seed energy that can be used differently. So the heart for you carried the seed energy to help you reveal yourself. But in the beginning, you weren't using the seed energy that way. You were using it unconsciously to hide. And then as you grew and developed, you began to use that energy differently. So it's just a reminder that sometimes people come to me and say, I want to get rid of that, or I need to give that up, or I need to do that differently. And really what needs to happen is they need to connect with the energy that's in it and find a different way to use the energy. 
you know, uh, I want to come back to this um, pure being. I, I, as you yeah. were speaking about this transformation through time or this transition through time of me with the instrument, I remember there being people who um, were guides at a moment. Like there, there's a guy mm -hmm. named Doc Severinsen. He's, he's a, a, a wonderful musician and was a conductor and um, or probably is still a conductor. And I was working with him and I was singing my song, The Nightingale. Mm -hmm. And it's a very simple song but I couldn't let it be simple. And I remember him turning to me and saying, stop doing anything. Stop, he said, sing it and play it like a child. Get out of the way, do nothing, let it come through. And that was a moment of a door opening of somebody, you know, opening that door for me. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, he was able to call your being forward. In, in his own way, we might say that that was a moment of meeting between you and him. He, he tapped into something deep in himself that allowed him to respond to you in a way that you connected with something in yourself in a, di in a different way, and in a way that freed you. I see. He, did you just say he spoke to my being and asked? Yes and called it out right yes he spoke to your being and he called it out and i think this is the greatest gift of human relationship it's sad when people when we keep relationships patterns going where we're doing the exact opposite <laughs> we all know what that's like but to be in relationship in a way that calls for the being the pure being of the other and that we allow that in us to come forward that's vulnerability <laughs> right and the way that you you're talking about yeah right and i see and i see that these other things precariousness unreliability um they're almost like cheap versions of vulnerability and mm. i'm like you know if i allow my equipment to be unreliable um I'm 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 actually undermining my vulnerability in some way because mm -hmm. I'm fussing with the equipment and I'm worrying about that rather than using my reliance on it to help me actually allow my being to be called forth. Right. Yeah, and and I think sometimes what we don't what we have to learn to do consciously is say okay if I'm feeling vulnerable because of this unreliable equipment or because every time I go, this is what happens. Then the next question is say, okay, how can I get myself some support in this? How, what's the support that I need so that I don't just end up in this vulnerable place, feeling helpless, powerless, aggravated, angry, frustrated, and waste all that energy. And so I think the other thing that when, when we find ourselves dealing with situations or even a place in us where we're not reliable for ourselves, then, um, <laughs> uh, then if we can stop and say, okay, so what's the support that I need here? You know, what's the support that I need, whether it's the support of the equipment or what's the support I need with myself to be able to take a different action, you know, or well, to be able to move differently in the world. And I wouldn't, yeah, to take, okay, to take a different action. And I, and as, based on everything you've said so far, I'm thinking that when I ask myself that, I would ask myself, what is the support I need for my being to come forth? Beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. 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 Huh. Wow. So is there anything else you want to say about this? I mean, because it, it's so, uh, on, on the one hand, it, I mean, we use the word vulnerable in a, you know, we're vulnerable to attack and yet vulnerability is what we want. How do we tell the difference? Well, I think, that as adults, we also have to differentiate that sometimes when we're feeling vulnerable and let's just say we're feeling vulnerable and an anxiety comes up, that the anxiety is a messenger. And we have to ask ourselves, what's this messenger telling me? Is there, for instance, an outside world threat that I need to 
be aware of and have a way of responding to? Or am I getting anxious because even though this person I'm in relationship with has never done anything to hurt me, I have this history prior to that person of these things happening and that history is getting lit up. And so now I'm, I'm feeling anxious about my vulnerability here, but it's not about the present. It's not. And so we, again, there's this learning to differentiate um, what, you know, vulnerability, well, I'm having converging thoughts, but you know, if you think about an infant, a, a human infant, there's not, no animal more vulnerable or no than a human infant. And so we all have this early experience where we were absolutely dependent, absolutely helpless, absolutely powerless. I mean, our power as infants was screaming and crying and kicking and spitting up, and, <laughs> which usually doesn't I'm still using really, that. <laughs> <laughs> and usually that doesn't, you know, parents and caregivers often don't respond well to those kinds of behaviors. <laughs> So from the very beginning, we often are getting responses to our vulnerable state that somehow cause us to go into adaptive patterns of behavior that ultimately aren't reliable for us and put us in precarious positions. <laughs> yeah. And so some of what we have to do is, or a lot of what we have to do as adults is we have to kind of get clear, is this feeling in my body about the present reality or is it an, an old historical feeling that something in the present is triggering? And once we can get that sorted, then we can begin to say, okay, how do I respond to my vulnerability in the present? in a way that does allow my being to come forward. And that does invite the moment of meeting in the space of pure being, first with myself at a bigger, greater level, then with someone else. Wow, so what I'm hearing you say is that the signals that we're getting are just not refined at all. So they're just like, it's ding, ding, something's terrible is happening, something terrible is happening. They're like, what? Your, your mom sent you to your room to clean it. And I'm like, that was you know, 50 years ago. Right. But it's, uh, so, so the, the signal is, is unreliable in terms of how in danger I am now. And it sounds like the signal, the filter is not refined at all or maybe that's what i just said in that i can't tell whether i'm anxious about um like the feeling of 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 going to vulnerable being open to a moment of meeting with my being mm -hmm. feels similar to um you know my microphone isn't working mm -hmm. and so it sounds like what you're saying is that the the process that maybe you help people with as an analyst, I mean, maybe that's why it's called analyzing, mm -hmm. is to actually be able to differentiate those things. Is that? Yes, that is an important piece of, of what happens emotionally, mentally, psychologically. So we have to learn to differentiate. And to differentiate, we have to have consciousness meaning we have to be aware not just with our head but with our body that consciousness doesn't mean intellectual insight consciousness is where the intellectual processes are working in conjunction with the body sensation and emotion to make sense of what's happening so is that also a moment of being with ourselves absolutely you know often people experience a moment of con gaining consciousness that moment of meeting oneself in the space of pure being as an aha moment or as a light bulb going up uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. it's like something clicks and it's a felt experience that then gives rise to a thought or an image but it's a, it's, I, I like cliff. That's not a real clinical word. But, you know, it's something, it's like 
something, the puzzle, the gears, all of a sudden are working more smoothly or the puzzle piece completes the picture. And so it's a different felt experience. So yes, those are moments of meaning with our own being. Yeah. That's beautiful. So my final question would be, what are some things people can do? I know what I would tell, well, I know what I told my students to do with music and I know what I do with music as in, you know, what are the steps to have that moment of being with pure, that, that moment of meeting in pure being. And that is to really identify, and this is so difficult, um, where you're struggling with technical um, disconnect with anything, um, but, but in particular with an instrument, and how can you simplify that so you can engage, so you're engaging with the instrument or the pen or whatever you're engaging with on a level that you actually can do what you want to do. And sometimes that means that what you want to, you need to, I would, I, you could say lower your expectations, but it's actually re relieve your expectations of being perfectionistic down to something that you can do, like I can play those notes with beauty and connection. Mm. And no matter what else is happening, if I lost my other fingers, if whatever, I can do that. And to connect with that is to, I, I experience open a door to the meeting, mm -hmm. to the, the moment of meeting. And if I can do that, along with something that's easy for me, like speak to you and look at you, then I'm creating a, an environment in which a moment of meeting and experience of being can, there's a space for it. Yes. So that's what I would say to anybody with an instrument, start getting start coming back to something you thought was way beneath you way way back and re reconnect with it and find its beauty find the beauty in it right yeah so so what you just said i want to i think is really probably one of the most uh, uh, um uh, pointed things we can do because as you just alluded to we can't make a moment of meeting happen because that would be trying to do something and orchestrate something which is the opposite but what we can do is we can set up an environment with that invites that so what you just said even about with the harp and the mother's day card musical card is by setting an environment where you allow yourself to relax and trust what you are confident doing and then you do that and you do it from the heart then that is what sets the environment and invites the moment of meeting so all that we've been talking about with reliability precariousness and vulnerability or unreliability notice i've changed that now we're talking about reliability really has to do with the environment of how we relate to ourself, how we respond to our own body sensations and emotions, how we think about and make sense of what's going on inside of us. And looking at all of those things is a way we then begin to tend the environment of our own being, which lives in our body mind. As you say this, I'm thinking the word achievement. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking that the word achievement is the opposite of that. That when we are trying to achieve, we are not being. And this reminds me of, in the Strings of Passion and the, the Principles of Creative Resonance, the fifth principle which is practicing and practice says mm -hmm. and practicing is when we are practicing to achieve something it's a certain mindset and when we have a practice that 
sounds to me like that moment that we are creating an environment where something can get to us, where we create a way for ourselves to be broken down and, and we surrender to that and we are vulnerable to that in a practice of something we can easily achieve, which seems very vulnerable to us, I notice. We feel vulnerable when we are doing something that anybody could do. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm realizing that was the turnaround for me in my harp career. I started as an adult. And so it was all about achievement and how long have I played and what can I do now? And, oh, you've only been playing this long, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And it, I, it got broken down somewhat when I played jazz because jazz is not about learning more and more and more and more and more pieces. It's about playing the same thing over and over again and living it. And then there was that moment with Doc Severinsen where it, you know, all that achievement I realized was the one thing that was getting in the way mm -hmm. of me making that connection through this particular song. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's such a beautiful piece of consciousness there because wherever we go for achievement and perfection, then we immediately start pulling up over our rawness because it's not okay. It's got to fit a certain form. It's got to sound a certain way. And so that in order to have those moments of meeting with ourselves, we have to give room for the rawness and for the most simple of things. I mean, in truth, all the profound spiritual traditions are very simple truths <laughs> because when we practice the simple truths, everything opens and it's true for us with our music it's true for us with our life it's true for us in our relationship to ourself and in relationship to other people in relationship to our instrument and so getting out of ourselves out of the way exactly what doc severinson told you get yourself out of the way just let it come yeah Right. Thank you. And that that comes from doing something simpler than you think is OK. Yeah. Wow. Kathleen, thank you so much. I'm just I love that we come up with a subject and then, you, you know, you can I, I love that we have each of our different experiences in life and yet they meet. I feel like it's a, a moment of meeting. Yes. I was thinking about that, that in a way we come together every week and our rawness and vulnerability check in, see what's perking and where's the meaning? Where's, where is that energy that wants expression between us for each of us individually, for us together and for all of our listeners? So, yeah. Well, thank you so, so, so much. And I look forward to finding out where we will be meeting <laughs> yes, and what we'll be meeting on and what being I will get to experience of myself and you. Thank yeah. you so much, Kathleen. This was really a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.